Good morning and evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on logistics disruption in the agriculture industry. Uh, I'm your host, Jinu Chun, and also known as JC, um, a global market analyst in the intelligence and solutions division here at Trich. Um, since uh, we have a very uh, diverse group here today at various time zones across the world, we're very, very excited to have you to join us today. Um, welcome again. Um, and yeah, now we have like nearly 50 people, 51. Um, yeah, let's uh, hope you all enjoy this webinar and then get insightful comments from our presenters and panelists. So regarding the view options, uh, for the most optimal viewing experience, uh, please click on the view options menu at the top of your WebEx meeting window. So it goes top and enable the stage mode to view both presentations and our speakers during the event. So if you set your um, viewing option as um, stage mode, then you will see presentation material and the most active speakers speaking on the top. So yeah, please keep that in mind. That will be helpful. Um, and let's move on to the next page. Um, um, today's webinar consists of three parts. So first part is global logistics industry overview. And for the second part, we're going to cover how this logistics disruptions um, affected mid industry. And for third part, uh, we'll dip, dip more into um, and the disruptions in the nuts industry. So after the presentation session is over, we're going to have a panel discussion and also followed by a Q&A session. So these are the contents that we're gonna to have today. Um, and again, um, welcome to the webinar on the logistics disruptions in the agriculture industry. And let me introduce myself briefly again. I'm your host, Jin Chun, a global market analyst at Trich. So we look forward to a lively discussion on how logistics disruption reshaped the global agriculture industry uh, with a special focus on the meat and nut industry. And today we have three presenters um, who will cover overview part and meat industry part and nut industry part. So we have uh, Prince Yawson, Senior Global Market Analyst, um, we have Per Kirkbeck, Mid Specialist and Global Market Analyst at Trich, and Theo Venter, Nuts and Seed Analyst, and also Global Market Analyst here in Trich. So these are our presenters today. And after our presentation, um, we will have a panel discussion with logistics specialists from all over the world. So today we have um, Pedro Tejas, uh, Purchasing Manager at Chiang Mai Yuhua Fruit. Um, he's based in Chile. And also, um, we have Trich's logistics specialist here, Alper, local, Alper Arkert from Turkey, and Lucia Marike from Peru. So um, again, um, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. So if you check uh, below the participants part, there's like a little icon thing uh, indicating chat room, so you can leave your questions there. So yeah, uh, so please feel free to share your idea so we can cover at the end of the presentation. So now um, we will welcome Prince Yawson, uh, who will present an overview of logistics disruption in the agriculture industry. Hi, Prince. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, I think with that introduction, we are ready to crack on, aren't we? Now, to begin, let's start with a preamble. The world needs to be fed and what is needed to feed the world needs to be moved in many cases from a farm to say a storage facility, then to continue the journey to another place, town or country before we find it on our retail shelves or in our homes. Now the inference made from this is whatever we consume our pets consume, our crops or our farm animals consume need a conduit, which is what we call logistics. And this is going to be our focus today. It is also worthy to mention that the medium of transportation of an ag product is dependent on the product itself. Grains and oil seeds will be transported by bulk freight, while meat, proteins and dairy products will be hauled in refrigerated containers and trucks. 
you may have containers on ships by rail or on trucks. And there is the air freight option also, which is used to transport some highly perishable agricultural products with a value to weight ratio, a very important factor considered before using this medium of transport. Lorry and container shipping is arguably and comparatively the most cost effective medium of haulage. It is worthy to mention that container ships move about one fourth volume of global traded goods and three fifth by way of value. If you look at global spending on logistics, it reached around 9 trillion US dollars in 2020. And that is about a tenth, so one tenth of the world's gross domestic product. Now, with all I've said here, if there's any truism in what I've just mentioned, then the importance of logistics in the agriculture industry cannot be overemphasized. The question is, what has happened in the last few years that has affected the ease or the cost of logistics? Now, the first thing I'll mention is Brexit, which is the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU in January 2020. And this has some effect on logistics. The cost of freight in the UK had been traditionally low, but after Brexit, new rules and challenges associated with acquiring health certificates and extra checks caused some logistical bottlenecks. We then began to see freight costs rising and prices of export lows from the UK to the EU edging up as well. Now for me, working within the retail sector in the UK at the time, I'm aware transporting dairy and animal products became Herculean that retailers and exporters alike had to make huge investments and contingency on addressing these new trade obstacles. Food companies and processors, retailers had to pay for example, they had to employ vets to satisfy their goods before exports. It goes without saying that these extra costs were pushed down to the supply chain. The next thing that I'll talk about, let's shift to what is the elephant in the room, you know, uh, and how this has impacted logistics and then, you know, the agriculture industry, and this is COVID. COVID-19, you know, when the world was confronted with the severity of COVID-19, you're all aware, everyone here would be aware that many countries across the world adopted policies to, con to contain the spread of the virus. China would buy a lot of agriculture commodities put in place a zero tolerance policy to, to limit the spread of the virus and close its ports. Now, what were the effects of this? The effects of this were labor shortages on farms and disruptions to farm input supplies. For example, distribution of fertilizers and pesticides and seeds. Now, if anyone who follows the market will be aware that China, for example, is a huge supplier of fertilizers and raw materials used in producing pesticides. So during lockdown, the production of these raw materials and pesticides were constrained, stifling exports of farm inputs to the rest of the world. Now, another example that I'm going to give is, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are top palm oil producers and exporters. Restrictions and border closures have some time now, limited for scale harvesting activity. Port closures also limited the ability to export palm oil products. And so we saw palm oil prices rally to unprecedented heights recently. The news of shortage of containers in many ports because they had been locked up in Asian shipping ports caused significant disruption and curtailed movements of food crops and other agricultural commodities across the world. On the back of all these, from the third half of around 2020, we saw container shipping prices going through the roof until they found a bit of resistance. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, if you look at this slide, you can see container index in March 2020 was as low as 1,344. Only a year on, they had quadrupled to 4,374 US dollars. And if you look at the index where it stands today, it's at just below 10,000 US dollars. That is a 622 percentage increase in the price index. The emergence of the Omicron variant in somewhere in Q3 of 2021 also added some pressure, rattling the container shipping markets. And when the US citizen, for example, started getting their stimulus packages, their purchases of merchandise goods shot up about 6% higher compared to the figure in 2019. 
And so while container shipping was constrained, we began to see increased demand for goods when the economy started opening up as well. What did we see? Did this impact the agriculture market at all? You can pay attention to the, right, uh, the graph on the right hand, uh, which shows the FAO's food index price. As you can see, the price index also rallied with a container index near doubling since Q1 of 2020. Both the meat, dairy, cereals, oils, and sugar index has taken a bit of a hit. Food price index in March 2020 was 95. The price index in March 2021 rose to 119. As of today, it's at 141. That is a 48, nearly 50% increase in food price in the since quarter one of 2020. So you can see the upward trajectory and the positive relationship. Whilst end users may not necessarily see the price of a food item gone up, let's use an example that I'm going to give uh, of the breakfast. I hope everyone have breakfast. Uh, if you compare your English breakfast bought from a cafe in early 2020 against today, you will realize that the quantity of the baked beans is smaller. Probably instead of three sausages, you are getting two sausages, or maybe the size of your hash brown has been reduced. Or probably even the tomatoes, if you were get, getting about half, you're getting a quarter now, instead of the half that you get in the past. So this goes to show, you know, how food prices would have gone up simply so just take 10 seconds to think about this and compare your breakfast plate in 2020 and today the one you bought from the cafe we have seen this happen in major agriculture commodity markets actually so what's happened over here uh, we've got trade analysts you know coming out or writing about the things that we talk about um Line prices in Mexico skyrocket year on year due to supply shortages. Um, the wholesale price of fresh lemon in Mexico has been a, has seen a substantial increase of 153%. And all these, if you read the story well, you'd realize that it's on the back of uh, the supply shortages and the freight costs that we've seen. Can we go to the next slide, please? Japan's food industry is running out of French fries. Uh, the global supply chain disruptions have forced McDonald's restaurants in Japan to take a large and medium price of the menu. So this is a typical example of the effect that we're seeing uh, from the logistical constraint. Can we go to the next, please? Over here, uh, Horatio says, lack of flight affects the berry sector. Uh, the berry sector has reported that its exports face challenges and threats to their sustainability. Now, if you look here, uh, can we go back, please, um, to complete that? Yeah, in both markets, there are difficulties due to the rise in the cost of transportation. Air freight to the U.S. have risen by 33%. And so it goes without saying that we're seeing significant effect of the logistics industry on the agriculture market. Now, look at the graph on the left. You can see global container price index seem to have stabilized and we continue to see improvements in congestion at port. But how is the most recent geopolitical issue uh, between Russia and Ukraine affecting the logistics and agriculture market? Russia and Ukraine are huge food baskets supplying the world with wheat, oil seed rape, rape seed oil, LC sunflower, sunflower oil and others. Now to put this in context, Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat and Ukraine is number five in terms of top wheat exporters. Now around 4% of China Europe rail freight travel through Russia. Now if you look at the graph, that's the Trans-Siberian route and about 2% via Ukraine. So you can see the role both countries play in feeding the world. The ongoing conflict is indeed rattling commodity and agriculture market. So far, ocean container spot rates from Asia to Europe and to the US have not increased on the back of the situation and the resulting boycott of Russian, Russian shipments by several ocean carriers. But we know Ukrainian ports shut in the first week of March and we're seeing a number of ocean carriers as well boycotting Russian shipments. Also, there are reports of congestions at some European hubs 
as Russia bound cargo stops are getting moved, worsening the congestion situation. The situation is also keeping crude oil prices elevated. And wherever you are, you would realize that people are complaining of you know fuel prices going up. All forms of freight use fuel to this without any fear of doubt. So that will put some immense pressure on freight costs, consequently agriculture industry. And also we may see carriers introducing some insurance surcharges because of the Ukraine-Russia situation, which I understand will be around $40 to $50. While the impact of logistics disruption on agriculture industry continue to unfold, we may see the former passing on the rising cost price pressure to the agriculture industry and food supply chains. And so as we all uh, continue to look at our markets or as we continue uh, to buy or sell our products, we should keep an eye uh, on whatever is going to happen within the logistics market, geopolitical issues, uh, crude oil prices going up is also going to have some effect. Uh, without much ado, thank you for listening to this uh, bit and then I would uh, would move to Pear, who will take over from me. Thank you very much, Prince, for the great introduction. I think we can go on uh, to my first slide. And just to start off smoothly and start in the uh, same lane as, as Prince left off with, we are still looking here at the Global Container Freight Index. And uh, if you remember the graph from before, actually where it kind of plateaus in the spring of 21 is where this one starts. And why I brought this graph is basically uh, just to show how easily reflected in the actual meat prices, these increases in price of logistics are. What we see here is that as prices increase from March 21 and skyrocket up through over the summer, the meat prices follow. And they follow more or less exactly, but like a month lag. So as uh, contracts that are already been shipped and agreed upon are shipped, the new ones follow these increased prices. And this has, of course, a direct effect on whoever the end user is and, and the, the retail link. But the increasing of, of shipping prices is not just for that product, because for uh, meat production, there's a lot of inputs going into it that also need to be shipped. So the fertilizers and the, the soybean meal, all the proteins going into the production also comes at an increase. So it almost has a double effect in, in the meat market. Uh, next slide, please. And so where the meat market sort of differentiates a little bit from, from some other, uh, or from most other agricultural trade is this complete dependency on refrigerated containers. And obviously that leaves uh, meat traders with only the choice to, to make use of a, 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 small, a smaller fraction of the total uh, containers available. Um, so what happens is that when we have a lot of congestion, we have this uh, huge demand for containers. There's a lot of um, congestion and that leads to uncertainty, that leads to delayed deliveries. And so turnaround time, the time that it takes for to have it delivered from port to port, have in some cases doubled. We have Australian exporters exporting to the west coast of US that says that their transport time has increased from 35 to 70 days. And with meat, uh, there's a very limited shelf, shelf life especially for fresh and chilled products. And so that leaves exporters with the, sometimes the decision, should we freeze the product or keep it chill? And this is a, is a very big choice because it comes at a big cost to freeze your product. You might not uh, meet up to the contracts, you might be penalized according to the contract because you have agreed upon delivering fresh product. But also what we see is that there's simply a, a, a big price difference between fresh and uh, frozen products. So the average price, unit price per ton of beef for, for frozen is $4,300, whereas for fresh or chilled beef, it's $7,400. And for some countries, this is even greater. So for US, the price of chilled beef is around 9,000. And for Japan, sometimes in the tens of thousands, because they have some very um, high uh, quality products uh, in, in low quantity. So basically, this means that if now uh, if we could stay uh, on the slide from before. Yes. So basically you look at a loss, if you look at a loss uh, at around 42%, if you choose to freeze your product in terms of the, and also the increase in cost of cooling. And that means for one container, 20 foot container that can hold what? 25 
uh, tons, it can be up to $78,000. So it's a lot of money on the line here for, for our timely delivery. I think we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, and, and another uh, trend we've seen in, in the meat markets, not only an increase in, uh, in, in how many products are shipped frozen compared to, to chilled, we also have uh, trade patterns, simply destinations changing. So what we see here on the, on the screen is that for the US pork market on the left, we have an, a, a global increase of 8.8% between 2000, 2019, I've chosen this because it's pre-COVID, to 2021. And so their exports grow at 8.8%. But actually, if you look at some of their nearby markets in Latin America, for Mexico, for example, the increase is 32%. And for Costa Rica, it's all the way up to 79%. Whereas the more distant markets, where the destinations are further away and where prices are higher for shipping, like Japan, minus 2%, Australia, down 45%. So this has, has clearly, uh, it's not the sole reason, but it's, of course, it's a contributing factor. When you have to pay more, you would like to upset uh, your, your goods at, a, at, at closer markets. Same thing is, is what we're seeing in Australia. There's an average uh, decrease between 2019 and 2021 for reasons more or less unrelated to logistics, but more to do with, with quantity available. Um, but actually the, the decreases in faraway markets like US and Canada is much greater than in the nearby markets and of, of which some in, in, in South Korea and Philippines even have uh, had uh, increases in export in this period. Next slide, please. And another, another interesting thing about the, the meat trade is that it kind of works in the reverse way of, of the general trade. So where you have a lot of consumer goods going from east to west, from Asia to the to the Americas, meat kind of goes the other way. So you have USA, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, shipping a lot of meats to the uh, very, very hungry and increasing Asian market. And so prices are much higher going from Asia to the US than back. And so when in Los Angeles and Long Beach, there are uh, port congestion and, and, and choppers getting stuff handled at the port, what we see is that the Asian shippers, they know that they can get up to 10 times the price for shipping their goods out of Asia to US. So they would rather go back with an empty container across the Pacific than wait a day or two for Americans to get their goods to the harbor. And uh, obviously uh, that has hurt a lot of producers and, and put a pressure on, on storage facilities. And uh, last slide, I will try and run over this quickly, just some quick updates. Uh, on what's currently going on. We have uh, a lot of problems in Australia with the floods, uh, complicating transport and, and handling, uh, getting beef and lamb mainly from the processing plants into the port operation. That's also coupled with an, the new outbreaks and, and isolation due to COVID. Then we have the Russian-Ukraine conflict, which is, yeah, impacting a lot of things. But, but in this case, the oil prices are going up, which will add to freight prices, but also might free up some container space because if containers are no longer going in and out at Russia, especially at the same pace due to sanctions and suspensions, then they might be available for other routes. And lastly, a positive news, that's always nice to, to end that, is that we have uh, one of the main routes for poultry and beef going especially to China uh, from the east side of Latin America, where we have seen an increase in service reliability. And so where is it for the west Latin America is down to around 65. At the east, we're now up at, at 90%. And so hopefully that will continue. And uh, that's it for me. I will pass it on to Theo Venter, who will uh, entertain you with uh, in, uh, a look into the nuts and seeds industry. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Per. And thanks for the, the intro. So a lot has happened in the nuts and seeds industry. Um, we're looking specifically at nuts today. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of the points I want to cover. Um, first, we'll just be a quick review of the market. Um, we'll look at the impact logistics has had so far, what we think is going to happen the next five months of the marketing season. Um, and we can also see some buyer behavior. And the last part will be looking into the short-term future of, of the nut markets and, and what could happen. 
So to cover all of this, um, let's crank on with it. So I think this map, if you just look at this map, it basically explains the whole situation. So the US is by far the biggest producer of almonds in the world. Um, and then virtually all these almonds are grown in California. And it makes up about 75% of the US's nut production. Then also pistachios and walnuts are the other big ones and the big ones being exported. Virtually all of them are, are being grown in California. So the other states that you see here, the southern states are mostly pecans and then Oregon grows some, some hazelnuts. But in effect, most of the nuts are in California. So it would make little sense for these nuts to be kind of diverted to other harbors other than Californian harbors. And as most of us know by now, the Californian harbors are, are some of the worst at the moment in the world. So um, as to options, what to do with these nuts, I mean, they're in California. Basically, the only viable option is that they need to go through these Californian harbors, which um, has caused massive delays. So, so if we go to the next slide, we can see what these effects are. Um, and before I get into that, I think there are just a few things or a few background uh, pieces of information we should keep in mind. So the first is that the, the almond industry is by far the biggest. So I'm going to be focused on the almond industry, but it looks very similar for pistachios and for walnuts. The next one is the almond marketing year starts in August and we've got data up to February. So that's seven months of the marketing year. Um, and also the harvest starts in August. That's why the marketing year starts there. Um, the third one is that comparing the, the volume of marketable supply of almonds in 2020, 2021, and uh, this marketing year, it's very similar. So last year started with 400 million pounds of opening stock and then production of 3 billion pounds, which is 3.4. And then this season started with about opening stock of about 600 million pounds and production of 2.8 billion. So that's also 3.4. So they're very comparable. So when we look at, at, at this, it shows the difference for the first seven months last season compared to this season. And it's about 20% less. This is only for export. So it's about 20% less than last year. So the first seven months of, of this marketing year, exports declined by 20%. And this is a direct result of the logistic problems. Now we can also see the destinations that it went to. Um, it's basically, a, a lot of them are equal. So they're all about 20%. Now Europe is by far the biggest market for, for nuts and then um, India is the biggest individual country buying nuts. Uh, some nuts going to China. The impact was a little bit less to Northeast Asia, so China. But as we can see, it's through the board. So it's not a specific route that's having problems. Um, and it kind of just shows like the, the congestion is in, in California. It's getting the nuts onto the ship where the problem is. Now we can compare it to also to previous years and look at domestic shipments. So if we go on to the next slide, it, it shows the um, marketable supply. Like I said, this is the opening stock plus production. And then which percentage of this had been shipped up to the end of February. So from August to February. So I think I'm gonna talk about domestic shipments first and, and get that kind of over with because it's not impacted so much. So usually at this time of the marketing year, about 14% on average of marketable supply has left um, or has been shipped domestically to other states in the US, right? This year it's 13%. So it's still kind of in line. It could end up being a little bit less at the end of the marketing year, but it's not as big a headache as for example, exports. So exports on the other hand, usually about 30, 36% of marketable, marketable supply has been exported until the end of February. And, and then this year it's only 29%. So a big drop in that. Now the question is for these first seven months, we've seen this big drop. Um, what's gonna happen in the next five? So if we go on to the next slide, it shows the percentage of the crop of the marketable supply being exported per month. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the harvest starts in August, it peaks about in September, October. Um, and that's also usually the main 
uh, shipping months for for export to leave California. Now, obviously, you know, it, it looks kind of terrible looking at August until January. Um, but a little bit of a, a little bit of a glimmer of hope is February. So exports in February jumped by 30% from January. And you can also look at it. Uh, I think now logistics, they're working around the clock and February is like three days less than January. So that's 10% less time. So in 10% less time, at least they were able to export 30% more. Um, and uh, of course it's coming off a very poor base in January. So a very poor, um, from a poor base jumping a little bit, but it, it does show we're getting closer to, um, previous years for at least the next five months of the marketing year. So we can kind of say, look, the first seven months, the losses in these first seven months and what's happening in the next five months, um, you know, the next five months will kind of be normal, but the first seven months they're, they're kind of lost. lost. Um, and then also, if we look at this graph, it shows the commitments of traders. So it's great that, that we have this data available because it shows the commitments means basically the almonds that have been sold, but they haven't left California yet. So committed as exports, but not, they haven't been shipped yet. Um, and I mean, here again, it's clear that buyers, the way they behave, they just didn't want to take any risks, um, even through the, the part that's usually the peak season. But from November, they were a little bit more confident that they would at least get their almonds, um, you know, if they buy them. So these almonds will be shipped in the future. Unfortunately, we don't know for when they are booked, but um, they, they will be shipped and the contract is signed. So buyers are willing to take the risk. And again, this is close to last year's um, numbers. So I think we can kind of with confidence say, look, the, the next five months will be pretty much in line with what happened in previous years. So the next five months will be kind of okay. Um, so that brings us to, to basically the main question, what's gonna happen next? So we can go to the next slide and there are a few points um, I'd like to make here. The first one is, you know, the question, so we've, we've lost, or, or there's been a big loss in the first seven months of almond exports. And if almonds can flow out of California much more freely, will the next five months be much higher? Um, I would say the simple answer to that would be no, because if you look at the, the way almonds are sold, they're being sold as a snack, um, or they go into the, the pastry industry, most of it. So, you know, if you're going to the supermarket and you've got a packet of almonds on your shopping list and you get to the supermarket and it's not available, you do the rest of your shopping and you go home. And when you go there the next month and you can buy almonds, you're not gonna buy two packets because you didn't eat almonds last month. Um, that's basically lost. Um, so the same, I mean, the same in the, the pastry industry, you're not gonna put in double almonds in your pastries because you couldn't put almonds in them last month. So a big part of what was lost in this seven months will be irreversible. Like it can basically be scrapped and it won't be made up. Um, so what does that mean? So in total exports could drop by about 10 to 15% from where it should have been, um, where there are no logistical problems. And the effect of that would mean there could be ending stocks of about 800 million to a billion pounds of almonds. So to put that in perspective, the ending stocks in August, when the new crop starts coming in is about a third of the new crop. So you've got a billion pounds in storage, and then you get a, another crop of probably close to 3 billion pounds on top of that. So this will bring a lot of practical problems. Um, for example, storage, um, like, you know, where are you going to store all, all these almonds? And uh, obviously the handlers, they will have foresight to plan for this, but you know, it, it brings a lot of practical problems to the market. And then one thing maybe we'll see for the first time this year, as far as I, as I, um, I've seen in historic data is that there could be some differentiation between the old crop and the new crop. Now, the reason for that is, um, you know, these almonds will be in storage in, in August when the new crop starts already for 12 months. And then it's a very big carryover. So obviously almonds goes in first in, first out, but we have this big carryover. I mean, at the end of the day, these almonds could be in storage for about 18 months. Um, now under optimal conditions, which is less than 10 degrees Celsius, 
low relative humidity, almonds can be stored for about two years. But, you know, there could come a stage where, where buyers are going to say, look, um, we only want new crop almonds or, you know, at least sell old crop almonds to the pasty industry at a at discount. So there could be more differentiation in, in the next marketing year than, than normally. The next one is, is kind of a dark horse. Um, what's going to happen in the Southern Hemisphere? Now, I think it can either make their season or break their season, the logistical troubles in California. So Australia has now become the world's second biggest almond producer, but to put it in perspective, they produce only about 10% of the U.S. crop. Um, and they have a very specific export season, which runs from May until July. When their almonds come to market, it's usually a little bit cheaper and they can export a lot to India, China. It also goes to, to Europe. But if the problems in California gets sorted before the main export season in Australia, these US almonds are just going to flood the market. And I think they're, they're going to flood Australia out of the market because, you know, sellers in, in the US will be desperate to get rid of their, their almonds. And it could make for a very bad season for Australian um, almond producers. But, you know, the other side is also true. If the, if the logistics problems in California continue, um, it opens the door for, for more um, exports from, from Australia. Um, and we'll, we'll see the same thing in the Southern Hemisphere. Like Chile has a lot of walnuts. Um, like I said, the situation is pretty similar for walnuts. Um, and, and it could also impact Argentina. Um, the last thing, quite a strange one. So, so both Prince and Per showed us um, the the prices of, or let's say the food price indexes and how many food stuff the prices have just skyrocketed. If you look at the dried fruit and nuts CPI, it's just a straight line. Like um, it didn't show the increase like any of the other food stuffs. Um, so. It's for dried fruits and nuts in Europe, but I mean, it's it's nothing comparable to to the other food stuff. Now, the reason for that is pretty simple. It's it's just because the the oversupply. There's just too too many nuts um, available, especially from the U.S. So there's not a real reason for prices to go up. Um, I would say because of being dragged higher by other food stuffs. Um, this price could increase a little bit, but there's a lot of downward pressure coming from the, the total oversupply of nuts. All right. So like I said, a, a lot of stuff happening in the nuts market. Um, if there are specific questions about nuts, uh, you can drop them in the chat. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but, uh, from my side, that is, that is it, um, in the nut market. And, uh, we'll go back to our host, JC. Um, thank you, Prince, for Theo, for your presentation. Again, it was very interesting. Um, we, I think, definitely analyzed well, like how logistic disruption affects meat and nuts industry. And as Theo mentioned, um, if you have any questions about global logistics industry and also um, the impact on meat and nuts industry, please uh, feel free to share your question and chat. Um, so we can answer, uh, we'll try to cover all like uh, at the end of the presentation. So now we'll move on to the panel discussion. Um, so again, during the panel discussion session as well. So if you have any questions, please post the question in the chat. So um, yeah, then uh, let's start with the question one. We all know that after the outbreak of COVID-19, the global agriculture industry has been affected by significant logistic disruptions, um, just for labor shortage issues, shipping cost increase, and container shortages and port congestion. So I want our uh, panelists to share uh, insightful comments. So um, we'll first going to have Pedro Teyes, a purchasing specialist. Uh, Pedro, uh, as a purchasing specialist in charge of, of Chile and Chinese market, can you uh, briefly share your insights on how has COVID-19 influenced, um, you know, agriculture industry, especially your case, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. First, thanks for the invitation. The presentation of Prince, Per, and Theo was very good, very accurate, I would say. Um, how about the question, how has COVID-19 influenced in the log logistic industry? I, will, I want to separate a bit of talking about Chile 
um, how that influence and then about China and their zero COVID policy and how we are like struggling with that in the last two years or three years. So for Chile, you can compare the our harvest season from 2020 to 21 and 22. So from, uh, yeah, like very strict policies of like uh, people that have to be aware of uh, some protocols in the bag inserting or in the harvest to have some issues that because of COVID outbreaks during harvest or bagging process. And then to 2021, that all the protocols are implemented and almost of all the population is vaccinated. So I will say that the how, how COVID impact was that because of this in the last season, because of these delays, um, the we have a like our stock of fruit during the summer season because uh, you have to stop buying house for seven days sometimes or harvest in the middle of the harvest you have to stop and then you have an accumulation and you're in a bottleneck and um, with china i will say that china is doing two things first and all is with this uh, zero coronavirus situation that they don't care if they have to stop a port or they have to lock down an entire city and they want to diversify ports they are trying to make usually hong kong is one of the main ports in china so they want to like uh, diversify and like try to make less important a uh, hong kong port so now what we are seeing is that for example i don't know if hong kong in 2020 and before release 800 or 500 containers per day and uh, now they reduce that to 300 to 500 containers per day so we are forced to go to china mainland and using ports in different cities like ningbo like uh, uh, shenzhen or nansha or shanghai so i think that uh, the logistic is is it's more complicated because in the in general you know, the vessel shuttles they didn't put that cities as a main port at least from Chile so now they have to diversify in the which port they will go first and how they will take uh, the containers and these small vessels to move around the different ports and of course with the lockdowns of the cities as at least what we are seeing now these days that uh, China is having an outbreak. Uh, uh, the ports in Shekou and Nan and Yantian that are in Shenzhen and Hong Kong are completely not completely stopped, but they are very slow these days. So everyone is moving the fruit to another ports that are very that are more nearby, like Nansha or Shanghai. But that is generates a lot of of volume that is going there. And as we work with we only work with fresh fruit, so we are struggling a lot because. From, I don't know, if before the COVID we had 25 or, or, or 28 days of uh, travel, now we're having around 50 to 55 days. Yeah, um, thanks, Pedro. Um, I think that was really uh, insightful comment. Uh, logistics also, uh, you know, disruptions also affect the internal logistics as well, in case of Chile. Um, so, Alper, can you uh, please elaborate more on the case of Turkey, um, how it has influenced it? You hear me, right? Uh, I, I will uh, tell about it generally. In the period uh, when the epidemic peaked in China, production stopped in factories in center of critical yeah, importance for the Chinese economy and industry and exported products were transported from factory uh, to the ports with low capacity and low delay, long delays, uh, cancelled vessel voyages and idle capacity uh, reached highest levels, disruption in the supply chain, etc. These and similar uh, developments have led to the questioning of the balances in uh, global supply chain and the uh, dominance of certain countries in addition since one country is an indispensable link for other countries and uh, the problems caused by a de dependent supply chain are 
clearly seen by other countries and countries that can read this crisis well and produce solutions will do their best to create a less dependent supply chain. In this case, especially in medium and long term, there will be a possibility of uh, weakening of Chinese dominant power in global supply chain, the problems please as China, America and China, Europe as well. In this con context, the importance of Turkey has clearly emerged and it's uh, in the uh, in this, uh, indisputable and that it's the best stop for its geographical uh, location, product richness and transit trade. Uh, the difficulties expensed in transportation of products imported from China limited circulation of empty containers in the world, and as a result, uh, container freight have increased greatly. Uh, freight increased, increases causes an increase in the share of freight in unit costs, especially for countries that export products with low added value, thus negatively affected the export of these countries as the world's seventh largest container vessel operator, Hanjin Seng. We know that when there is a crisis in shipping, it surpasses to all shipping agencies. Yeah, um, thanks, Alfred, for your answer, um, for well elaborating the case of Turkey. Um, Lucia, it's your turn. Uh, please share uh, your market comment and uh, proving industry, please. Yes, uh, well, COVID-19 uh, impacted drastically the supply chains all over the world. The lockdown and the borders closure between the countries affected and changed the regular flow of import and export operations, significantly changing the consumption patterns as well. So, may, unfortunately, many companies were to suspend their operations, disrupting global supplies of goods. And the pandemic has left several vulnerabilities, which remains affected by a shortage of crew and labor due to isolations, availability of containers and capacity at major, at major ports. So the product offering has now grown proportionally to the availability of equipment. There is a serious mismatch between soaring demand and reduced supply capacity. But well, luckily, uh, I think worldwide and in Peru, for example, despite all this uh, forced closure of lots of companies, the agriculture sector and its exports never stopped. Moreover, that sector has experienced an amazing growth, surpassing its volumes and also records. For example, we have become the world's leading exporter of grapes, berries, and asparagus. So also to mention another, uh, Another positive outcome, the, the pandemic has imposed the virtuality and development of electronic platforms, speeding up some formalities. And also we have reached new markets. So above all, we found new opportunities as well. On the other hand, uh, perishable products are more sensitive and more likely to suffer losses and decay, specifically uh, when talking about transit times extension. Nowadays, the risk is higher than before, and the logistics operations have become more complicated. Yeah, um, I see. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, thanks for all uh, for sharing your insightful comments. And uh, now we'll move on to the second question. So, what is the logistics outlook in the agriculture trade? So, for this question, uh, Trich's logistics specialist, Lucia and Alker, I think you can share the uh, like your. Uh, the case of case of your country. So, Alper, um, in the previous question, you mentioned that the countries will be try to be less dependent on supply, like in a certain supply chain. So, in line with this, um, like, what is the outlook for the next few years in Turkey? Uh, uh, for my country, we are doing our best to increase our export uh, share in foreign trade. And existing companies entered entered new markets, and many companies uh, started exporting. But there is serious difficulties in transportation, as I uh, told in other topic. Uh, not enough not enough space, especially on the river side, 
uh, they accept bookings uh, weekly according to equipment and space. This makes it difficult for us to make a plan by giving dates. And uh, of course, the disruption in seaway, the uh, efforts of the reactivate of the ship road gained speed, and it's in this context, railway services were developed from China to Turkey, from Tur Turkey to Europe, Russia, and Azerbaijan. Increasing sea freight and road freight prices have led to activate use of air, air transport for some perishable and uh, valuable cargoes. So there was also a significant increase in air cargo load. So professionals like us can find solutions in some destinations with intermodal transportation, uh, offer combined transportation options or work with shipping agencies on project basis with contracts to be able to decrease our logistics costs. In order to offer such solutions, of course, we need to predict our total shipments from port to port or from country to country. Um, yeah, Alfred, thanks for uh, sharing your insight. Um, Lucia, also, you share that the situation in Latam is quite, uh, you know, hectic right now. So do you think that this will continue? Uh, yes, like two years after the start of the pandemic with a progressive rapid growth in demand of goods. Unfortunately, we are still facing this kind of disruptions like, for example, port closure, vessels doing quarantine and interrupting their voyages. And therefore, the transit times have drastically increased uh, due to serious delays. Vessels are changing their itineraries by skipping some ports and leaving behind lots of containers waiting to be picked up and uh, shipping rates have ridiculously increased in rating expense, expensive costs of runs. So as mentioned before, in, re in regards to the agri sector, the risks faced daily are now higher. Still slow when requesting spaces to their containers and above all the uncertainty to dispatch their perishable cargo and expect to not suffer any delays that may affect their wholesale and profit and also the fruit or vegetables condition. The decision making has dramatically changed. Sometimes companies willing to pay a more expensive price cost through sending some cargo by air instead of uh, exposing their commodities to face some loss to mention one one example. Yeah, um, Lucia, Alper, um, thanks all for um, sharing insightful comments. Um, let's move on to the last question. And we'll talk about what are the some cases of logistics issues that um, countries have faced currently. So I think it would be great if you can share, especially which product, which regions um, and which market. So yeah, please uh, share in detail all. So Pedro, um, is it the same in Chile? Like how is affecting agriculture trade between China and Chile? Uh, like how is um, like how is the like the impact of uh, logistic disruption on the agriculture trade? Can you elaborate more of the case? Well, I will talk for China. In like, if you are imported company you are facing like more obstacles in all that is what all that takes the customer release more you have higher cost and it's much more slower and then when you really like you can release the the container and so on inside of china we are we are seeing a lot of more strict policy like a strict control between cities especially if you're nearby to, to beijing uh, and I mean, like control, like they stop the, the driver of the truck and they make a COVID test. And if it's possible, the guy have to go to, for a quarantine and so on. So we're facing that a lot. And that means that everything is more slow. And we start to have issue if it's fresh fruit that you're, you're adding days to the cell or to the, I don't know, to save the fruit in full storage. And um, for Chile, I will say more than all is that if you don't have to 
send fresh fruit to uh, far away destinations, it's better not to do it. And we're seeing that, like, uh, we see that exportation of fruit that have to go to China, I don't know, like cherries or maybe some grapes or nectarines that are like hard, hard fruit in the case of nectarines that can travel uh, more than 40 days. Uh, they have to go there. But if you see, like, I don't know, apples or um, some grapes or now the pears, pears and kiwis, I think more of the exporters will choose to uh, export in South America or nearby country, nearby continents than take the risk to go to the far East Asia uh, because of these issues and uh, uncertainty that China's generation generating uh, with this uh, zero policy of COVID is too high for uh, the exporters in at least in Chile and I will see, I will say that in Peru too because like we don't in general Chinese doesn't work with a, in fresh food doesn't work with a fixed price so they always try to do a minimum warranty and then it's you know that you're very depending on a, on a, a like issue that you cannot control that is the freight freight time and freight cost so they need to open more markets and maybe ask profit but it's their only option if they want to have a i don't know a, a, a more safe business so from china and what we are doing is that we are not taking too many fruit now the the the, the the cherry season is over and the summer fruit here is over too. so we are like we are passing we receive offers from south america and we are passing because we know that if like where what we are seeing these days if we have an outbreak and the uh, and the port is like with a lot of a lot of containers to be released uh, the, the quality of the fruit will drop a lot so what about what happened is the, the service is that we had like, I don't know, 6,000 containers to release in the Hong Kong port and the fruit start to have, uh, so you have a, a freight time of 30 days, 32 days to the port. And then it, only in the, in the line to be released was like 12 more days, 12 to 15. So that generates a big bottleneck and a big mess in terms of quality and in terms of, of sales performance. So I think that is some of the cases that we are being confronted during this last, during this year and the last two years. Amazing. Uh, Pedro, thanks for sharing uh, cases. Um, Lucia, um... Would you like to add more about the cases happening in Peru? Sure. Yes, uh, some issues we are currently facing, not only in Peru, but in South America, are the lack of bookings availability. In some cases, the fruit, once ready, cannot be loaded because there are not enough spaces for the selected destination. This loading delay added to the transit um, of the ship can trigger fruit deterioration and sales loss. This 2022, for example, we have experienced some serious delays. I'm talking about like between 17 or 23 days in some shipments. So why this is happening? Because vessel due to vessels roll ups, ports in quarantine, late arrival to the ports and transshipments. Containers were sometimes left at the transshipment ports for two weeks, changing drastically their itinerary. Cold treatment shipments were affected too due to port congestions, closures, or they lost their connection vessels, incurring inexpensive energy costs overruns in order to complete their protocol. Another thing to mention is the worrying, the worrying rise in freight costs, and they keep uh, constantly increasing. In some cases, considering the urgency and the timing, air shipments result more convenient. That significant difference between rates has reduced. It is crazy how all these factors changed. 
And there is a lot of hard work and decision making to do, uh, strategizing first which shipping lines to work with for each desired destination, taking into consideration uh, critical factors like transit times, availability of spaces, and freight costs. Working with a forecast would be ideal, regal regardless if in the end it's not 100% fulfilled, but that will give us more chances to get the desired bookings. And it is also important to rely on insurance companies, one that offers a floating policy with all risk covered. Nowadays, they are covering delays from the 10 day of delay, but it is on us to try to decrease this number. And it is also important to mention an effective planification, coordination, and communication within areas uh, throughout the company, like sourcing quality and logistics, like we have been doing in Trich Peru. And um, besides the satisfaction in knowing that the containers um, on air shipments or sea shipments arrive at destination on time and with the product in optimal conditions, the success of our operations will also come down to minimizing costs. So as logistics professional, the higher, the higher the risk, the bigger the challenge, and it's our duty to seek action to try to mitigate this risks and reduce the cost throughout the whole supply chain to deliver our products in the best possible condition and also timing. And, and despite all this craziness and hard situation, we are touching more to making more markets. Yeah, thanks all. Um, Alper, Pedro, Lucia, all thank you for sharing your um, insightful comments. So that is pretty much it for the panel discussion. Um, so we'll be proceeding to the Q&A session. So um, we'll now address some of the questions uh, that are posted during the webinar. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated and posted uh, questions in the chat. Can we move on to the next page, please? Yeah, um, but due to time constraint, uh, we will be able to cover only one question and then um, we'll, yeah, but um, after the after the webinar, we're gonna send out the survey form. So please feel free to share your questions in the form. So we'll try to ship, we'll try to answer as much as possible um, after the webinar is done. So um, our question is, so um, let me um, actually, uh, so from um, Emmanuel Nanji, um, so you asked about um, the cocoa beans. So the question was, can we can we get how logistics will affect the price of cocoa beans in the near and immediate future? Um, I think Trins, um, you can cover this question according to your experience. Hello, uh, Nanji. Uh, thanks for that question. I mean, already we continue to see, you know, significant uh, impact from logistics within the cocoa industry in West Africa, say Ghana, La Côte d'Ivoire, or in Nigeria, in, in Cameroon. You know, you you would see that we are we are, we still see the unnecessary checkpoints along the road, which results in delay and congestion. Right. We we also know that there is the low speed of the trucks that is used to transport the beans from the hinterlands to the ports. Uh, for example, they would run about an average of around 30 to 40 kilometers per, per, per hour on those primary roads, uh, and the roads itself are not good. So already, we we are seeing that this these uh, factors are affecting you know are affecting the cocoa beans market and the cocoa industry. Um, how is that going to impact the cocoa bean industry going forward? Definitely, if on the back of these things, if we're seeing the cost of freight going up, container price index as well going up, as we've uh, said before, definitely uh, we would continue to see some price pressure within that industry. And as you're aware, we we continue to have that conversation in cocoa around the minimum way, the minimum prices, especially in Ghana and cocoa, trying to come together, you know, to set a minimum price so that the farmers would have a lot from there. Uh, so, yeah, going forward, I think um, the logistics industry, uh, the impact will, will, will affect the cocoa beans prices going forward. Yeah, thanks, uh, Prince, for answering. I um, hope um, if, uh, uh, his, answers, uh, his answer uh, uh, satisfies your questions. 
So yeah, uh, it seems like our time is up for the Q and A session, and let's uh, wrap up the presentation quickly. So we had an overview of logistic distribution in the agriculture market, and with a special focus on the meat and nuts industry. Uh, the panelists answered questions regarding how the global logistic distribution affected uh, agriculture industry, and we also did a, a quick Q and A sessions. So yeah, after the webinar, um, the presentation slides will be shared in the follow up email within three business days, um, including re recordings of um, today's webinar and survey for the webinar. So again, uh, for the question that we couldn't answer, please uh, leave the question on, the web, on, on our survey form so we will try to uh, answer as much as possible. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for today's webinar. So uh, on behalf of Trich's Intelligence and Solutions Division and our presenters, panelists, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.